That's nice. Okay. Okay. Might as well start. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to How to Smash Your Nuclei. I'm your host, Zach Constan. I am the outreach coordinator at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory at Michigan State University, which is behind me. And what I'm going to do this morning is just give you a little tour through, you know, virtual through the laboratory as much as I can. We are running today. We're running experiments. That's what we're paid to do. And that means a lot of things are, of course, closed off due to radiation. And I'm not going to go those places. But I can take you in a lot of places that I would never take a tour group normally. Uh, for instance, up on this very high place. Uh, but I really wanted to show you this. So let's turn it around. Instead of looking at me the whole time, let's look at the lab. Here we go. This is a nice, nice perspective on what the laboratory really is. We have this humongous room. We call it the research area. And in that room, we have a lot of smaller concrete rooms. You can see an awful lot of concrete roof beams. That's what these things are right here. Right there, concrete roof beams. And then we've got this extremely wrong room. Let's see if we can get a good look at the whole thing here. I'm standing up on top of the clean room right now. There you go. And way, way in the back there, let's see, right about there, I can see the tips of the cyclotrons. So what do we do here? Let me give you a quick rundown. Our job is really simple. We want to study the nucleus of the atom, and there's a lot of things we don't know. And the way you study nuclei, this is true in a lot of physics. Uh, if you want to learn something new about a particle or whatnot, you want to smash it as hard as you can and learn something new. So what we have is two superconducting cyclotrons way back there. And those two cyclotrons, circular particle accelerator, make nuclei about half the speed of light. It's not bad. And then we, once they're going really, really fast, we smash them hard into a target. By that, we are actually trying to make rare radioactive nuclei. If you break a nucleus, you can knock off some protons and neutrons. You actually change what element and what isotope it is and you know, make it into something that would be interesting, something we want to learn more about. So we, we make it go fast, we smash it, we filter out the pieces we don't want. We have some mass spectrometers back there. Oh, uh, this is about in this area right here. Can't really see much from here, but uh, those are all running right now, so they're behind six feet of concrete. So that's the best I can do, at least for today. Uh, but then once we've got new nuclei that we want to study, then we have a lot of detectors. I'll show you a few as we go. So the name of the game in nuclear science and a lot of physics is let's accelerate the particles let's, and let's smash it hard. So accelerators are really important. Uh, our cyclotrons are actually two of the best in the world. They're really fantastic. We built them both in the 80s. Now let's start moving around. i got other things to show you. Uh, well, what we have here is a fairly messy roof to the clean room, but... This is also a great way to show you another accelerator that we have. Uh, cyclotrons are circular particle accelerators. They were invented back in the 30s. That's, you know, it's, and they're good at accelerators. It's just they're relatively old technology. And we can do better with newer technology. I am lucky enough to be able to show you this. This is what we call RIA-3. This, this green wall you see is actually lead shielding. Uh, most of our shielding around here is six feet of concrete, and we could not fit six feet of concrete up here on this shelf, so it's lead. It's not very thick. And behind that lead shielding is a short linear accelerator. I'll actually be able to show you more things about that kind of thing in a minute. But uh, this short linear accelerator actually does us some really some good. Uh, it actually can accelerate nuclei to approximately half the speed of light. That is equivalent to four times around the Earth. I'm sorry. That's what the other cyclotrons do. I'm so excited. I'm starting to tell you. Okay. This one goes to 8%. The cyclotrons get to 50%. This only does 8, which does not sound very exciting. But 
uh, 8%. It's, it's something like what you might find in a star, like nuclei traveling in a star. Eh, maybe 8%, maybe a little longer. Uh, it's about 3.2 MeV per nucleon for those keeping score. And, you know, 8%. Because they're, they're star-like, right, when they're traveling that speed, uh, if you want to understand how a star works, this is cheaper than going there. Let me just say that, right? This is an opportunity for you to study nuclei as they would behave in a star. So behind those green walls is the accelerator. Uh, you can see here we've got a lot of pipes for the, the helium. Almost all of our equipment is superconducting, so we cool it all with liquid helium down to 4 Kelvin. That's minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Not bad. Uh, let's see. Over here is where we ionize them in this little chamber here. That's EBIT. Uh, so this is a really specialized new kind of accelerator. It's fantastic. We love it. And, you know, it's something that our researchers wanted, but also it's really important because it's kind of a proof of concept, which I will explain to you. I'm going to take you around and actually give you a look at the guts of that kind of accelerator. See, I'm going to walk a little bit. Here, I'm going to walk and talk. There you go. You can look at me. How exciting. So here's the thing. We happen to be one of the top, rare isotope research laboratories in the entire world. There are, uh, you know, there's a good one in Germany, a really good one in Japan, uh, but we're in the top three. We're one of the best places to do this kind of stuff. And, you know, even though you can be top three, there's always going to be experiments that are beyond your current capability. So in the end, you know, and this is true always, right? Every laboratory is going to eventually fall behind. You can't do all the experiments that you want to do. So, all right, I'm walking down here. I'm now at the far end of the research space. What I really want to show you is this. It's uh, really a hive of activity today. Not bad. All right. So basically, what these gentlemen are working on, that is what's inside the linear accelerator that was up there. I showed it to you, short linear accelerator, RIA-3, we call it. Uh, and inside there are these cylinders. We call them superconducting radio frequency cavities. They are really exceptional. Um, and as you can see, they're really working hard on getting these ones ready. Basically, these accelerators are all in a line, and there's, of course, a hole that goes all the way through, basically. Uh, and as nuclei travel down that pipe, each of these cylinders, in turn, charges up to a million volts. Basically, uh, that's what gives a kick to the nucleus. If you want to accelerate charged particles like a nucleus, then you apply extremely high voltage, and that is exactly what these things do. So, nuclei come in. Let's see, right there. This charges up to high voltage, shoots it through. Next one, next one, next one. You guys are doing good. Keep it up. <laughs> so this is a really impressive new kind of a, uh, linear accelerator. New. I mean, literally, we made it up. Nobody's ever done one like this before. It's extremely exciting. So in the end, morning. in the end, um, we built a small one, and that was up on that shelf over there, right? Um, that's great. But, like I said, we want to do experiments that we can't currently. Well, we're building more of these, a lot more of these. And we are going to put, you know, these in boxes like they have up there. And in those boxes, we are going to have plenty of insulation. There you go. This is a nice look at the insulation. That is, right, I, we, all of our accelerators use superconductors, so they're all cooled down to 4 Kelvin. The insulation and stuff like this. This is aluminum, 14 atoms thick. And we put layer upon layer upon layer underneath and around all that equipment. And we can keep it very, very cold. So, so here's the thing. We want to be the best. We want to do the kinds of experiments that nobody else has ever been able to do. That's what we want. So what are we going to do? A few years ago, we have... We competed for and won a project called the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, FRIB. 
and we call it Ephrib. And Ephrib is going to be better, much, much, much better at doing rare isotope research. Why? Because we're going to replace our cyclotrons, two of the best cyclotrons in the world. We're going to completely replace them with a 400-yard-long linear accelerator based on this technology. Like I said, we made up this kind of linear accelerator. Uh, we are building the first ones in the world. Uh, the very first one ever, of course, was up on the shelf over here. And that is proof of concept. We're going to build a lot more of them, about 300 of these cylinders. Every one of these cylinders costs about $100,000 to produce. Uh, so it's not a cheap business. Uh, the effort project is $730 million total. That's your tax money. Thanks. Anyway, so the excitement here is we're going to build this new accelerator. It's going to be far better than the cyclotrons that we have. And with this accelerator, uh, it'll be 400 yards long, made of this stuff, 35 feet underground, so it'll be extremely small. And that, extremely small, extremely deep, that's how we block the radiation. Uh, but that new accelerator is going to get nuclei going about half the speed we can, I mean, twice the speed. See, I'm so excited. Anyway, twice the speed that we can do now, right? Okay, twice the speed, twice the energy which is about 57% of the speed of light because of relativity. And the big deal is right now we only smash a billion nuclei per second, uh, which sounds like a lot until you remember Avogadro's number. A billion is absolutely nothing. Uh, this accelerator it can accelerate hundreds of billions of nuclei per second. That's critical. So by smashing more, basically smashing far more nuclei, we'll be able to get more more nuclei of interest and measure more things and do a better job learning stuff about nuclei. So guys, that's what we're up to here. Uh, if I could take you outside, I would show you where we're building at the Ephraim Accelerator. It's right outside this door, uh, except for the fun fact that there's no Wi-Fi out there, so we're going to stay in here. But of course, they're assembling parts for that accelerator right there. Uh, here's another part of that ch chamber that they're building. We call it a cryo module. It keeps things inside very cold. Great. Uh, here is a crane. Wow. Okay. So the reason we have one big crane, uh, bit room here, it's a very very long room. That crane can roll up and down anywhere in the room, lift up the 40 tons. All right. If you want to smash nuclei, you need a lot of very specialized, expensive, and heavy equipment. So um, we got to be able to move it, and we always are moving it. Uh, a good example are the walls, actually. You can get a good look at these walls. So they're three feet thick or so. They have hooks on the sides, though. That's the key. The hooks on the sides let the crane pick them up. So these are 10 or 15 tons, and the crane just picks them up and rearranges them. And we do that all the time. Uh, I've been here nine years. We've not stopped tearing the laboratory apart, and we're not going to stop. All right. So that's our future, guys. And uh, if you come out and want to see the Ephraim Accelerator, uh, please come out in 2022 or later, because that's when we should be done. It is a long-term project, you know. But nobody's ever built an accelerator like this, so I'm not terribly surprised, right? It's going to take a long time to do. Uh, we're going to get it done. And we've come a long way already. But, you know, you guys probably are far, so since you can't get here, we'll do a little more. I'll show you a little more about what we do. Here's another crane. We have a lot of bridge cranes around here. That's how we move things around. Uh, across the street, you can see the law building. We're smack dab in the middle of the Michigan State University campus. So, you know, we're in the middle of everything. It's funny because, of course, you know, thousands and thousands of students walk by every day. They have no idea what we're doing. So um, now you guys actually know more than they do. What can I say? Look at that. Look at that. That, my friends, is a cyclotron. So, I mean, I just told you that we're, we're actually going to get rid of our cyclotrons. Uh, I also said that I couldn't show you the cyclotrons. So let's stay right here. Couldn't show you the cyclotrons because they're on, uh, and that's true. But this is a third cyclotron that we're building right now, uh, which is especially odd since we, you know, we're replacing our cyclotrons. We're literally tearing them out in favor of that new linear accelerator I showed you. Nice stuff. So, you know, why are we building a new cyclotron? It does seem kind of odd. 
Well, that cyclotron is not for acceleration. Every cyclotron ever built has been for acceleration. This cyclotron is for stopping. It's literally reverse of every other cyclotron ever built. So basically nuclei will come into this cyclotron at half the speed of light already. And you know, a cyclotron is basically just a huge magnet. So the nuclei come in, they go in a circle in the magnetic field. They're orbiting inside the cyclotron because that magnetic field is so strong and they're all charged particles. So nuclei are orbiting inside the cyclotron. But you know, where all of their cyclotrons would you know, apply high electric field, high voltage to accelerate, this one is full of helium instead. And as our nuclei bounce off the helium, they slow down, basically. They run into stuff and they slow down. So in the end, you know, let me give you a get better look. In the end, they're orbiting, but then they're slowing down. So they're actually spiraling in. So let's see. They go in there. They, they orbit here. They spiral in. And eventually they exit out that... Yeah, that exit port, I guess. I'm going to show you why not. Uh, and that is where they come out. And that, when they come out, they're much, much slower, right? They're, you know, not half the speed of light anymore. They're more like, you know, thermal energies. It's very, very slow comparatively. Uh, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you want to study nuclei, you know, if you want to study nuclei carefully, uh, sometimes low energy is really, really useful. Uh, for instance... There you go. There's a nice angle. Jeez, this thing is huge. Uh, it is 14 feet tall. It is 170 tons. But see, here's the thing. You want to study nuclei very carefully. For instance, you want to weigh a nucleus, and we literally do. If you want to weigh yourself, you don't drive over the scale at 70 miles an hour, I assume. Uh, if you want to weigh the nucleus, you know, you don't want to... <laughs> you, you can't do it generally at half the speed of light. So you have to literally... Stop the nucleus, and that is what we do, right? Uh, to, to smash them, we can up to half the speed of light, uh, but to measure their mass very carefully, uh, and we can measure their mass to one part in 100 million, that is equivalent to weighing a jumbo jet and telling how much change is in the pilot's pocket. Not bad, right? So if you weigh the nucleus uh, at very low energies, you can get a really good result. That's why you got to stop it first. So... Um, fun fact, there are other stoppers, gas stoppers, what they call them. Uh, they use helium, like I said. Uh, this is the first of its kind in the world. No one's ever built a cyclotron gas stopper or backward cyclotron. <laughs> Excuse me. So in the end, uh, this is a cool deal. Uh, we made it up. We're building the first one ever. It'll be operational, I don't know, maybe within the year. Uh, but what's great is, you know, nuclei spiraling in, they can travel up to 400 meters in a spiral before they stop. So um, basically they can stop all different kinds of isotopes. It's great. So we're very much looking forward to being able to use this. And again, like I said, you know, the researchers want to be able to do lots of different kinds of experiments. So being able to stop the nucleus and do a very sensitive experiment is very important. So that's what we do now. Uh, I've shown you some accelerators. I've shown you where we actually make the nuclei that we want to study. There's different kinds of accelerators, but, you know, in general, going fast and smashing is useful. So now I'm going to show you where we actually measure the nucleus. Uh, we actually have a whole lot of, of detectors uh, for measuring the nucleus. But, you know, some of them I can't get to right now. These I can. And these are actually pretty photogenic. Of course, it's important to note, how do you measure something like a nucleus? I mean, the nucleus itself is uh, 10,000 times smaller than the atom. And the atom is barely visible by the most powerful microscopes. Um, well, all the detectors basically run the nucleus into something that can, you know, can produce some evidence that has been there. Uh, the way this one works is actually kind of ingenious. So let me step back for a second. So you see this big green box. That's just 
that's just shielding a whole lot of metal shielding. Uh, it's mostly to contain the magnetic field, actually. This yellow circle you see here, a yellow, yellow doors block the white circle. There we go. Um, that white circle is a magnet. It's an MRI magnet, actually. And if you've ever seen an MRI, you know, that's what they look like, big white magnet. You can see where a human would actually go in there. Um, this was supposed to be an MRI magnet. We ended up getting a hold of it for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, fun fact, MRIs were nuclear detectors first. So when we got a hold of this magnet, we were able to turn it back into a nuclear detector. You know, sure, pretty straightforward. And instead of putting a human inside, what we've got is a chamber with a lot of wires. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty impressive. Uh, okay, so in this chamber, it's full of helium gas. So um, I showed you the reaccelerator on the other side of the wall, way back there. Um, that makes nuclei travel about as fast as they would in a star. This chamber is full of helium, which is kind of the material you would find in the stellar core. So, all right, so I'm gonna let nuclei come in here and they're acting like they're in a star and they're seeing what they might see in a star. So we're gonna see what kind of reactions are, are gonna happen. Now, what happens is they run into the helium, they ionize it, they knock electrons off, and those electrons are, they're ionizing, right? They're just getting, making free electrons. Those free electrons hit the outer wall of the cylinder, which is full of electrodes, lots and lots of tiny wires. And if an electron hits an electrode, basically it registers as a small amount of electric current, right? How do you measure what's going on? Well, the ionization that it creates on helium, those free electrons create a small amount of electricity flowing through these electrodes. Based on how much electricity I see, which electrode it is, when I see that electricity, this detector literally tracks individual nuclei in three dimensions as they travel through the helium gas. Not bad. Um, so you want to know how far does the nucleus get in a star before it runs into something else? Uh, what kinds of reactions can occur? Um, you know, what are the chances of reactions? That kind of stuff. Uh, you want to understand how a star works internally. This is cheaper than going to the star. Clearly. That's very exciting. So this is a wonderful, wonderful detector. We call it the ATTPC, active time, active target time projection chamber. There we go. This is a lovely mm, portable clean room. Here, let's go around here. I want to show you this detector. Uh, so this is a room basically that ac accepts nuclei from the reaccelerator. So they're all traveling about the same speed they would in a star. So all these detectors are studying, you know, star-like reactions basically. All right. So this chamber, which has Kang and Kodos from The Simpsons on it, because why not? Uh, this chamber is for quasi-fission studies. Uh, so basically, what a star does in general to make energy is fusion. It's you know basically making nuclei run together and stick. That's fusion. Quasi-fission is when fusion almost occurs but then fails. So two nuclei run into each other, but they don't quite stick. So what quasi-fission does basically is limits how much fusion can occur. Sometimes fusion fails. You want to understand how fusion works in a star. You need to, you know, reproduce those kind of conditions. And this is a great way to do it. This is a wonderful, wonderful detector for that kind of research. Like I said, quasi-fission. I'd never heard of it either until they came up with this thing. Oh, the reason they have Kang and Kodos is because this is clearly a flying saucer. I mean, look at it. It's just it's a flying saucer. Um, but, of course, the reason it looks this way is that if you're going to send nuclei in here to do experiments, there can't be air in this chamber or nuclei hit air and stop. Um, it totally ruins your experiment. So uh, basically all the air has to be pulled out, which means that the air outside would crush the container if it wasn't really built like a submarine effectively. And that's the case for all of the beam pipes around here. There's no air in any of this stuff. There you go. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a kind of a better...
perspective on what's going on here. Let's go around. Get a nice look at, wow, there's a lot of interesting looking equipment. I don't know what that is. That's part of the fun of this laboratory. There's so much stuff going on. Nobody knows what everything is. I do my best. Let me tell you, this is a place I do not take <laughs> tour groups at all. So I'm kind of excited to show you guys this. But uh, you can get a better perspective up these stairs. Look at all the cable trays. They're not full yet. That's because they haven't put all the equipment in yet. Here, let's get a look. So as you can see, what we have is several different beam lines. Uh, you know, nuclei can go down here and go into the ATTPC. You can do, you know, star-like reactions. Uh, or they can go down here and they can end up in the, you know, quasi-fission. Then go down here and they go to ENSA. It's a jet experiment. It's um, a lot of things you can do. A lot of things you can do. So here's the thing. I really like, I'm, I'm glad to show you this because, you know, number one, you can really see what's going on. It's, it's ridiculous. I want you to understand how ridiculous it is. It seems a bit overwhelming. Like, how does anybody ever actually do this? Well, we have over 600 people working here. We have about 40 researchers, 150 students, and then the rest of them, which is more than two-thirds, makes it go. You want to get involved in this kind of stuff? We need researchers, obviously, they do the, the stuff, but we need physicists, chemists, engineers, computer people, mathematicians, plumbers, welders, all kinds of things, right? Pretty much every kind of engineering you can think of, obviously. There's a lot that needs to go on. And, you know, it would be overwhelming for one or two or a few people, but for 600 people working together, all these systems can be set up and maintained and improved. Uh, they're really, really exceptionally good at keeping all this stuff running. It's actually fairly impressive. Uh, I think so, anyway. So, wonderful, wonderful laboratory. I, I couldn't be prouder of it. They do a great job. Uh, like I said, top three in the world. We're building EFRIB. It's going to be number one in the world for this kind of research. 2022 at the latest. 2020 at the earliest. Now, here's another thing I really wanted to show you. I told you there can't be any air in the pipes, right? So there's no air in all these pipes, all this equipment. Uh, so somebody has to be dealing with the vacuum pumps all the time. Here you go. Here's the vacuum pumps. Uh, there are 13 of these vacuum pumps right here for this particular experiment. And every one of those vacuum pumps is named after a dwarf in The Hobbit. Because that is the kind of people you get in this kind of laboratory. So vacuum pumps, lots and lots and lots of them. Uh, there's obviously also going to be a lot of machining. Uh, you know, some things we can buy ourselves, but we do build a lot of our own equipment, uh, like magnets, like this one right here. Uh, this magnet is a quadruple. You can probably see four coils. There's a, these black coils. There's four of them surrounding it. And as the nuclei, the beam of nuclei travels inside those four magnet coils, uh, that configuration of magnetic force focuses the beam. It basically keeps it going in the right direction. Uh, very, very, very well. So somebody's got to build these magnets. Somebody's got to build all this equipment. Somebody's got to keep the air out. Somebody's got to keep it cold. Uh, somebody's got to run all this, <laughs> all these pipes and wires and things. Jeez. Oh, here, this is Lego loss apparently. Jeez, okay, I learned something new. That's really interesting. It's, guys, this is cool. So that's Jensa there. Jet experiments for nuclear structure and astrophysics. Uh, and apparently there is a radioactive source that they've been using in there. So, you know, don't open it up, basically. <laughs> the beauty of this uh, virtual tour is that you guys don't need permission forms. Because let me tell you, you can't just wander around back here. That's why you're with me. I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right. A lot of other equipment. Let's see. These are for a nuclear polarization experiment. That's pretty much all I know about it. But 
they're fairly impressive. This is sun, summing NAI, so sodium iodide detector. And yeah, it kind of looks like a sun. Not bad. Uh, that's a detector. So these are, you know, photomultiplier tubes. Basically, these are big crystals inside here, sodium iodide crystals. A uh, beam of nuclei come in this hole here. And as they're traveling through, you know, they're going to generate particles, which when they hit the crystals, the crystals generate light. It's a scintillator, right? How do I tell there's particles there? It makes light. Simple. Well, that light gets in these photomultiplier tubes. These amplify light, just like night vision goggles. Same thing. Uh, and then these will send an electrical signal out to a computer somewhere. The computer says, ah, I saw some light based on the light I saw. Okay, I can tell you something about where the particle was and what kind of particle it was. Lots of great detectors around here. This is a wonderful one. It's, uh, it's, it's extremely sensitive and can, you can pick up an awful lot of stuff. Um, even, basically this one is really hard to overwhelm with data, which is nice. Because sometimes you're getting so many particles and so much light that you can't actually separate out what's from what, right? But this can. Uh, it's great. And there's a lovely poster about it. There you go. All right. Let's move out. Okay, there is our receiving dock. Lovely. Now we're back in the main hallway of the laboratory. Uh, Everywhere you see the walls and floors change color, that means we added on to the building. This building, the first part was in 1964. We've added on 10 times since 1964. Ooh, I want to show you this. There you go. This. These kind of screens are all over the entire laboratory. They tell you what's going on right now. Uh, right now, Dirk Weishar is doing an experiment. He is using Gratina and the S800, uh, which uh, that's why I couldn't take you in that room because it's, uh, it's in use. We're accelerating argon 36. Great. All right. Well, here's the thing. Uh, my favorite thing about this particular chart is these percentages right here. It says availability. Uh, one day. Look over the last 180 days. Well over 93%. Well over that. Here's the thing. You've seen all the complicated stuff that's back there. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. But our people are, you know, they're exceptional. And they work hard and they care about what they do. And because they all work together so well and keep everything running, we are more than 93% reliable. Things do break. What can I say? You know, things are going to break down. It does happen. But because uh, of our really amazing staff, they keep it going. And uh, that's great because researchers come here from all over the world they want to study this kind of stuff, and we can make it possible for them. So there you go. If you want to know what's going on in the laboratory, you go look at those hallway displays. They're all over the place, and it kind of keeps you up to date about what's going on. So here you can, you can see some of the office space. That's very exciting. Uh, this actually is fairly interesting. So liquid, li uh, actually liquid lithium cooled target. Um, EFRIB is going to accelerate so many more nuclei and smash them hard that you're going to, you know, produce an awful lot of heat. So if you want to cool the target so it doesn't melt down on you, uh, they've got to come up with some new ways to do that. Liquid lithium might be one way. But, you know, here's, this thing is, again, custom, right? You don't buy these things at the store, so you've got to make it up yourself and you know, design it. We have our own R&D, research and development. We have our own machine shop, engineering, welding, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, there you go. This, well, when they were designing the first superconducting cyclotron here at the laboratory, that was back in the 70s. And in the 70s, let me tell you, they did not have all the computer design software they do today. And the computers were, frankly, not so great. So how do you design something like that? Well, they built it out of wood first. This is what it looks like on the inside. This is the K500 cyclotron, world's first superconducting cyclotron. So this is how they actually made sure everything would fit. They just built it out of wood. Obviously, it doesn't work. But um, 
on the inside of a cyclotron, you have sort of D's and, and hills. And uh, so these, these look like fan blades. They don't move, but they do charge up to 140,000 volts in the larger cyclotron. This one is more like 60,000 volts, I suppose. Super high voltage is what makes the nucleus go faster and faster as it's so it, it's traveling in circle because of the magnetic field. It goes faster because of high voltage, and eventually it'll get to the edge of the cyclotron and be extracted. That's how you make nuclei go fast, at least right now. We're building this cool new linear accelerator. It's going to be great. Um, and then the cyclotrons, you know, they will have served their purpose. They've done a good job. So I'm going to take you back into a conference room. Sounds great. But, you know, basically I want you guys to have a chance to ask some questions. Uh, and I'm going to switch over. In a second. There we go. All right. I need this. Yes. Here. All right. All right. Okay. 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 Killing me. Yeah, okay. Hang on just a sec. Okay. Uh, very good. So this is our chance to ask questions, basically. Um, I don't see anybody on there, so I'm going to make a quick phone call. Hope you guys enjoyed your time. There we go. Uh, basically, I'm going to call our friends in the... Wisconsin. Why is this thing not turning off? There we go. There we go. Okay. 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 Well, just ask me questions. That's what I think we're going to have to do. Uh, I, do, it, do it by phone. I can't switch over easily. But yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, very excellent question. Okay, for everybody here, the question was, how do you get the air out of the tube? How do you make sure it's out of the tube? Uh, okay, so there's basically two things. First, you got to pump, right? You got to get the air out. Um, we have lots of different kinds of pumps. Uh, some of them are very simple vacuum pumps. You know, just use diffusion pumps. So basically, once you pump air down to a certain level, there's not much air left. And if you keep pumping, it's just not going to be very efficient. Uh, we have diffusion pumps, which basically rains oil down on top of the air, which pushes it down to the bottom, where it condenses and it gets dense enough that a vacuum pump can actually pull that out. Uh, so that's a diffusion pump. It basically rains oil. A third one. Uh, is a cryopump that literally freezes the air out of the pipe, um, which is kind of cool. So anyway, um, so here's the thing. Th that's, that's how we get the air out. But then how do you know the air is out? Uh, of course, we have lots of different kinds of gauges for measuring the pressure inside the equipment. Um, there is a gauge that basically looks like a really old light bulb um, that is basically designed to detect extremely low pressures. 
Uh, that's unfortunately I don't know how that actually works, <laughs> but uh, I know it. I know it does, and I know people who would know how it works. So you know, it's it's possible to get the to, the air out of the pipes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I hear, I hear, okay, I hear so, yeah, I see. Uh, how large would a linear accelerator have to be to accelerate a person to near light speed? Okay, got it, got it. Nice. <laughs> okay, so I can answer a couple of these. These are good. Um, so. Uh, how large would a linear accelerator have to be to accelerate a person to near light speed? To near light speed. Thank you for saying near light speed. Um, accelerate a person to. Seriously? I mean, number one, an accelerator makes things go fast by electromagnetic forces. So a person would have to be positively charged or negatively charged <laughs> to make this work. Um, sure, though, let's just say. Uh, I'm going to give you a whole lot of extra protons or electrons. Fine, you're going to be positive. Okay. Um, a person, of course, is a lot more massive than a than a nucleus. So, uh, how long? How large? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'll do a I'll do a calculation later, but let's just say um, from here to the at the current technology here to the current technology uh, with the new accelerators that we're building. You know, here to the moon, maybe? I don't know. It's really big. <laughs> it's huge. It's just, it's huge. Because um, the humans, that's a lot of mass. And near light speed, of course, you know, what? Um, right now, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, can get your nuclei going, you know, approximately, you know, 99.9999% of the speed of light. But, you know, human, geez, that's kind of nuts. Uh, all right. Why would we need to get rid of the cyclotrons for the new accelerator? Okay. Thank you for asking. Uh, okay. So several questions here. I'll answer them in order. Uh, why would you need to get rid of the uh, cyclotrons? Well, um, here's the thing. Uh, the cyclotrons are, are fantastic, and um, you know you can imagine using them to kind of inject into the larger accelerator, so they would still be useful. The problem is that the new accelerator can handle far more nuclei than those cyclotrons can can pump out. So what that really means is <laughs> uh, you need our, our cyclotrons are like squirt guns and the new FRIB accelerator is a fire hose. That's my that's my favorite analogy. But you know so it, it just wouldn't be useful. Um, and of course, you know, we'll be plugging in the new accelerator right where the cyclotrons were, so moving them out of the way. So it is taking the space to some extent. Um, that's that's what it's doing. That is why it's important. Uh, okay. Ooh, another one popped out. This is working, guys. Yeah, I've never done something like this, so good job so far. Um, how safe is all of this? Legitimate question. What is the possibility of any radioactive material escaping? Okay, here we go. Uh, no, this is really exciting stuff. Uh, well, it's crazy safe. Let's just say that. Number one, they want people who work here and to visit here to be safe. Uh, if you work here, you have radiation safety training. I got my dosimeter badge on me right now. Uh, I've been working here for over nine years, and I'm still perfectly normal, so it's fine. But, uh, you know, so what are the real dangers? Um, you know, people are concerned about radioactive material, and we literally make radioactive material in the building. But, but, it's not that much. Relatively, it's not that much. Um, we actually have less radioactive material in the building than a major hospital does. Uh, and we really only have it while we're making it. Uh, we make extremely short-lived nuclei, so they exist for less than a second in general. So the beauty of it is we only have radiation while we're making it. And while we're making it, it's behind walls. Right now, the walls are six feet of concrete. That blocks the radiation pretty well. And 
um, you know, the new accelerator, which will be much more powerful and far more radiation, is going to be buried 35 feet underground. Uh, and all that dirt basically blocks radiation for you as well. Uh, now, when it comes to radi radioactive material escaping, right? Uh, like I said, we've got all these walls and everything like that, uh, and the radioactive material lasts for very short times. Um, in the end, you know, not, we just don't have it. Yeah, I'm still here. We just don't have enough uh, radioactive material, and it won't last long enough for it to go anywhere or do anything, really. So that's it's safe. It's crazy safe. We wouldn't do it unless we were really, really sure that was uh, that was safe. Um, and you know, I I take tours of you know thousands of people through a year. Um, we wouldn't take them through if it wasn't safe, obviously. Good. All right. Let's see. Are there more. Ooh, there's a new one. Good. Thanks, Josh. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. What are the research opportunities for undergraduate and graduate students? Great one. This is a really really good one. So here's the thing. Uh, we happen to be in the middle of a university. That's a big plus, a tremendous plus. The laboratory does host, like I said, 150 students. And uh, you know the grads are doing research. The undergrads, I mean, some are not doing research. Some are moving big concrete blocks. But some of them are doing the research. And so you know, the advantage here is that you can get your hands on and do it yourself. What better way to learn nuclear science? Uh, that's why our laboratory, our university, happens to have the number one nuclear science program in the entire country. You know, take that MIT and everybody else, number one. So you know, pretty excited about that. But so in our laboratory, grads are always doing research. If you're an undergraduate student, a college student, uh, you can get research here. Uh, generally, by joining uh, the Honors College or the Lyman Briggs College, they both place students. Uh, ooh, Bill, I see your video now. Bam. Uh, so they, you know, there's lots of ways uh, to get research done in here. And of course, during the summer, we also do research. So you can um, there are programs you can apply for to let you do that kind of stuff, which is cool. Called REU. If you, when you get to college, look it up. Research experience for undergraduates. Are you? That's the way to go. Cool. Right, I've gotten all the ones that have been on here so far. Any other questions, you guys? Oh, cool. Cool. We're having problems with sound, though. Are you there yet? I'm still, yeah, I'm, I can see you guys now. On the phone, it's right? But we don't have sound. We have to a different. System. We got a. We finally got an invite for the hangout thing. And okay. So I, I clicked on that. That worked now. But I. But Good. now our sound doesn't work. So uh, we might have to go back the other way anyway. But uh, I'll. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll contact our IT person here right away. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks. I'm gonna. You're incredible. That's what you did there. Good. Okay. I'm <laughs> glad it came through. <laughs> it, it was, I'm glad it came through. And uh, I want to focus on uh, specifically what you're saying instead of trying to tell what you're saying. It's just simply. Uh, I presume that we're going to get an invite for uh, the Galactic one, or is it going to change right away? Yeah, well, you should basically you should be able to go to it and click on it and and, and get into it. Uh, you know, as soon as it starts. Right now on our, our screen, our screen, uh, you're showing up uh, like live, but no sound, and that's where okay. we're where we're at right now. All right. And again, so in the first case, we'll have to again. Okay. I mean, worst case, you can always go to the YouTube. Feed. In theory, that should work perfect. Right. It's good theory. No, but. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to stop this one so Mike can start the next one. Okay. No, I don't have to go. Okay. I will see you later. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.